Hi, I'm Jim Dennison with Dennison Forum, and this is the Daily Article for Friday, March 19th, 2021. The title is, Georgia Alleged Shooter Was Active in a Southern Baptist Church, Three Responses to the Sins of Christians. Delana Ashley Wan and her husband were on a date last Tuesday and decided to get a massage. They went for the first time to Young's Asian Massage Parlor near Woodstock, a town north of Atlanta. When a gunman attacked the parlor, Delana and three others were murdered. Her mother later told reporters, I'm lost, I'm confused, I'm hurt, I'm numb. Two other Atlanta area massage parlors were attacked as well. Eight people died in all. Authorities charged Robert Aaron Long in the worst mass shooting in the United States in almost two years. The story is tragic on so many levels. Six of the eight victims were women of Asian descent. The suspect told investigators that he targeted the businesses because he blamed them for, quote, providing an outlet for his addiction to sex. Here's the part of the story that I'm being asked about. According to his youth pastor, the suspect was active in a Southern Baptist congregation. Brett Cottrell, who led the youth ministry at Crab Apple First Baptist Church in Milton, Georgia, from 2008 to 2017, told the Washington Post that long stacked chairs and clean floors as a teenager. Cottrell added that Long's father was considered an important lay leader in the church. The family attended worship services on Sunday mornings and evenings, as well as meetings on Wednesday nights and mission trips. Cottrell considered Long a typical teenager growing up in the Atlanta suburbs. He stated that Long was part of a high school group that met for Bible study once a week before school and helped a backyard Bible club with games and songs for kids. According to authorities, Long's parents identified their son from surveillance images of the first shooting on Tuesday and alerted the sheriff's office. They're very distraught, the sheriff said, and they were very helpful in this apprehension, he added. Without their help, according to authorities, the carnage could have been even worse. A man was shot and killed Wednesday afternoon inside Emerald City Bible Fellowship Church in Seattle while participating in a church gathering. We've become tragically accustomed to the frequency of such shootings in recent years, and we often ask why God allows bad things to happen to God's people. But when church members are the shooters rather than the victims, we're forced to face a different kind of question. What difference does Christianity make when those who claim to be Christians act in horrific ways? Clergy abuse scandals have rocked the Catholic Church for years. However, Catholics are not alone in this. According to a 2019 report, 700 people were sexually abused in Southern Baptist churches over 20 years. The Ravi Zacharias scandal continues to make headlines. We could list other evangelical leaders accused of sexual misconduct in recent years. The Bible promises in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God's word says of believers in 1 Corinthians 6.11, You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So why then do Christians fail morally, sometimes in horrific ways? One answer is that like medicine that promises to make us well but makes us sick, our faith does not do what it claims to do. If Christians are not more like Christ than anyone else, why follow Christ? My response is that our faith never promises that Christians will be made perfect in this life. Sanctification requires cooperation, which is why Colossians 3.5 says we are to put to death what is earthly in you. Even the Apostle Paul admitted in Romans 7, 19, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Conversion starts the process of sanctification, but that process is not completed in this world, as Philippians 1, 6 shows us. A second answer is that people who claim to follow Jesus but sin in horrific ways are not true Christians. That may well be true of specific individuals, but the Bible teaches in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If Jesus was tempted, we will be tempted. As Hebrews 4, 15 says, if Peter could fail, as we find in Galatians 2, we can fail. This fact leads to a third answer. Becoming a Christian does not remove our free will. You and I were created to love our Lord and to love our neighbor. Love requires a choice, so God gives us freedom to choose and honors our freedom. 
For more on divine sovereignty and human freedom, I'd invite you to see my website article on luck and providence. When Christians sin, the fault is not with Christ, but with us. The Holy Spirit will give us the strength to defeat temptation, as 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, but you and I must seek this help daily, as Ephesians 5, 18 teaches. Let's close with three practical responses to the tragedy in Georgia. Number one, pray for the families of the victims, asking God to grant them his peace that passes understanding, as Philippians 4 speaks of, and to raise up Christians who will minister to them with his compassion and grace. Then volunteer to help the hurting people you meet today in the spirit of Jesus. Number two, ask God to reveal any areas where you need to repent of sin today. I'm not suggesting that you're going to commit murder, but James 1.15 says, sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The best time to repent of sin is now. And number three, submit your day and your life to the Holy Spirit, asking him to manifest the fruit of the Spirit in your life as described in Galatians 5, and to sanctify you completely as 1 Thessalonians 5.23 promises. Leave no area outside his control and his power. The Scottish theologian John Bailey offered a morning prayer to God that I invite you to pray with me, quote, By your grace, O God, I will go nowhere today where you cannot come, nor seek anyone's presence that would rob me of yours. By your grace, I will let no thought enter my heart that might hinder my closeness with you, nor let any word come from my mouth that is not meant for your ear. So shall my courage be firm and my heart be at peace. Here's the question. Will your courage be firm and your heart be at peace today?